Okay, this morning we are going to jump right into the scriptures. So let's turn together to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, we're going to be looking at the first seven verses together. Verse 1, Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. I can tell you right off the bat, just from this one verse, I can tell you why it is that the Pharisees and the other religious leaders did not like Jesus. Look at the kind of people that came to him. Tax collectors and the sinners. Remember what we said? What was it about the tax collectors and sinners that was so special that they were constantly being mentioned in the Bible? They were pretty much the scum of society. Right? The tax collectors were the men who served under a foreign government to rip off their own brothers in the bloodline of the Israelites. The sinners were the women who were either the prostitutes or the adulterers. Basically, people in society you don't want to associate with. And verse 1 tells us all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him, right? So just imagine for yourself, Pharisees, religious leaders, Sadducees, you are looking at this Jesus, this man, and he is supposed to be, supposed to be some kind of religious leader. He's teaching things about God, but everywhere he goes, what kind of people does he draw to your meetings? He draws a riffraff of society. He draws the people you don't want to hang out with. And so... Pharisees don't like him. And they, we see in verse 2, respond in a very predictable manner. Verse 2, and the Pharisees and scribes complain, saying, this man, okay, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Right? Not only do they come, but he allows them to come. He, he associates with them. He receives them into his presence. And then, he, what does he do with them? He eats with them. Eating with people is a sign of intimacy. It is a deepening of the relationship. You are, you are connecting in a way that, you know, the Pharisees are looking at Jesus and saying, you not only receive, but you eat with them. You're dirtying yourself, right? Remember when, when Jesus went to the house of Simon the Pharisee, remember how Simon reacted when he saw the woman coming to wash his hair, right? If only he knew what kind of woman she was, then he wouldn't have anything to do with her. And, you know, it, it seems to be a recurring theme in the Gospels. And I think it bears some looking at that, well, again, Pete, Jesus draws the lowest of the low, right? What we see in Luke chapter 5, and you don't have to turn there, Luke chapter 5, 31 to 32, Jesus answered and said to them, the, the religious leaders again, those who are well, have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, right? How many of you would go to see a doctor if you're not sick? Well, I, I, I do once a year just because I want to get my money's worth, right? I, I get my free yearly checkup, but other than that, unless you are sick, you don't really need a doctor. So those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, this is Jesus speaking. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, Jesus, he wants to share his heart's burden for those who are lost. And so he goes on in, in chapter 15, he goes on to tell this parable that I think all of us have heard at some point, And I think many of us know it very well. Verse 3, so he spoke this parable to them, saying, What man of you, which one of you here, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? Verses 3 to 4. Now, I will confess, I have always had a little bit of difficulty with this verse. Because what happened to the 99 sheep that he left in the wilderness? Right? I've always thought, what if while he's gone, these 99 sheep start to scatter and go astray? Because you know, if you know anything about shepherds and sheep, the reason the sheep need the shepherds is because the sheep are dumb. They don't know how to take care of themselves. They Look, you, you put them in the pasture, they're going to sit there and eat until the grass is gone. And then they'll sit there and starve because they don't know to move over to the next patch of grass. Right? Sheep need shepherds. And so while the shepherd's gone looking for that one lost sheep, what happens to these 99 sheep? And so growing up, I, as every time I've heard this parable, 
I always start to think, okay, maybe, maybe these 99 sheep are the trained sheep, the good sheep. And they know, they know that they, don't, they shouldn't wander off. And they know, you know, maybe the shepherd says, all right, you guys stay here. One of us is gone and he's precious to me. I'm gonna go look for him and you stay here. Don't go anywhere, I'll be right back. Right? I always tell my kids this. If I need to get off the car for a second, I'll tell them, don't go anywhere. It's like, where are they gonna go? They can't go anywhere, I took the keys, right? But I always imagine this, that these sheep, these 99 sheep, somehow, somehow they have to have been trained. They have to be good sheep. Otherwise, the shepherd would not have left them. Otherwise, he would not be a good shepherd, right? And we know that this parable is talking about Jesus' good shepherd. And so, so all these years, I have always thought that, of course, of course, these 99 sheep, they must be, they must be the churchgoers. They must be the believers. They must be the Christians. And so they are good. And therefore, they won't wander away. They won't do any bad things. And Jesus has already saved them. And so he doesn't have to worry about them. Right? And, and so I started to grow up thinking that as a Christian, as a believer, as someone who is saved, I am the 99%. Right? We're not occupying Wall Street here, but I, I am the 99%. I am part of the good crowd. Right? And of course, in Sunday school lessons, we always see this. We have these illustrations of the shepherd who goes to great lengths to find his lost sheep. Right? In, in the account in Matthew, it actually says, if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the 99 and go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying? And so these pictures I used to see in Sunday school would show the shepherd and he would climb mountains and, and go through valleys and then come and they would find the sheep entangled in the thorn bushes and he would you know, go in there and pull back the thorns and branches and he would get all scratched up and then he would put the sheep on the back. The, the shepherd goes through a lot of trouble to find his lost sheep. Right? And in, 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 in Sunday school, we would always emphasize that with the kids. Right? As a kid, I, I heard this emphasized to me. The shepherd went through so much to find his lost sheep. And so it's a really beautiful picture. It really is a beautiful picture of the lengths that Jesus went through to save those who were lost. Right? And then we go on in verse 5. In verse 5. And when he, the shepherd, when he has found it, this, this silly sheep, he lays it on his shoulders and he's rejoicing. He's happy. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost, and they all had lamb for supper. No. Um, I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. So what does this passage tell us, to teach us? It teaches us that Jesus loves those who are lost, and he will go to great lengths to find them. Right? Now, this passage also teaches us that we shouldn't be like the Pharisees and we shouldn't look down on sinners because look at how much Jesus cares for them and to what lengths he went to save them. And it's very clear, it's very clear from this passage, from this parable, that Jesus is a shepherd. And it's very clear that he cares very much for the lost sinners and all the focus and attention is on that one lost sinner. And we, the 99, were expected to stay and behave while Jesus goes out to seek the lost, and when he comes back with that lost sheep, all of us will rejoice with the heavens, right? Because we are better than that one lost sheep, right? This is something we have to be careful of. There's something very, very wrong with this picture, right? I'm gonna rewind a little bit. Remember the verse I, I, I uh, shared from chapter five. Jesus answered and said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. So Jesus has come into this world to call some people to repentance. What is repentance? Repentance is that there is a change of heart, that you are turning away from sin and turning back to God. So if you're righteous, if you're righteous, and there is no need to be called to repentance because there's nothing to repent of. If you're righteous and you're not a sinner, then there is no need for Jesus to call you to repentance. Right? And so it, it, is, it is true. Jesus didn't come to call the righteous. He didn't need to seek out those 99 sheep. Right? They didn't go astray. They're not lost. And, you know, when we first believe in Jesus, when we first believe in Jesus, when we're first saved, we are filled with gratitude. Right? And so the song that we sang this morning, it, it would resonate with us when, when we are first saved. You know, when we sing about the tenderness. In tenderness, he sought me. 
when I was weary and sick with sin, and on his shoulders he brought me back to his fold again, while angels in his presence sang until the courts of heaven rang. And as time goes on though, as time goes on, as we become mature in Christians, as we continue in our walk, what happens is sometimes our hearts harden. And then we start to draw a line between us and them. There's us, the 99, and there's them, the lost one. Right? And there starts to be a, a, a separation. We, we are the believers. We are the Christians. We are the saved. We are the 99 sheep. We are the righteous. Right? Yes, we need to love the lost because look at, look at the way that Jesus loved the lost. Look at the lengths he went through. And so we need to love the lost the same way Jesus loved them. You know, Alice and I have been invited to speak at a workshop later on this month to speak on evangelism. And one of the surefire ways to make sure that the gospel does not reach the heart of those who need to hear it is if we have this us and them attitude, right? People who don't know Jesus, who have not heard the gospel, or who have heard the gospel and have not accepted it, if we come to them and they can smell this us and them, you can be sure that the gospel will not be preached. It will be preached, yes, you will say the things you should say. You may read the four spiritual laws, all the things, you go through the motions. It's going to fall on deaf ears because we feel like somehow, we feel like somehow because we are saved, because we're believers, that we're better than they are, right? Those who are well have no need of a physician but those who are sick. And so we preach the gospel and we come to them and say, here, here, you know, I, I care for you very much because, because you are sick and you need to be healed. You know what? We, we start then to start to take on a salesperson mentality, right? And then we start as we continue to evangelize, as we continue to preach the gospel, it becomes a a routine. When we start to develop sales tactics, we start to look for, you know, surefire methods to preach the gospel, surefire methods, uh, foolproof ways to convert people to Christ, right? For this workshop that Alice and I are speaking of, we're trying to come up with a title, and I'm trying to be uh, sarcastic. I, I, I get sarcastic sometimes. I was going to title it, Surefire Ways to Preach the Gospel and to Evangelize. 100% money back guarantee if you're not satisfied, if people are not converted to Christ after you follow these methods, right? But the point of the workshop is going to be that there is no tried and true method, right? Because once we go down that road, once we start to have a routine, once we start to have this separation, you know, we start to think it's my responsibility as a righteous to get the message out to the unrighteous. And the minute we start to think that, the minute we start to separate ourselves, from the riffraff, you know what? God has something to say about this. He has something very strong to say about this. In Romans chapter three, verse 10, you don't need to turn there because it's short. As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. Anytime you start to think that because you are saved, because you are a child of God, that you are somehow righteous and you're somehow better than the riffraff and the, the, the scum, come back to this verse and read it again. There is none righteous, no, not one, right? You may think, well, I, I'm pretty good, right? And I think most of us are pretty good. I, I've known most of you for a while, you're not them. But in the eyes of God, there is none righteous, no, not one. Anytime you start to think that you are somehow better, remember, there, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hammer this in. There's a reason I keep saying it. There is none righteous, no, not one. Over lunch, when we go to order, what would you like today? There is none righteous, no, not one. I want this to just pour out of your heads this morning. Again, there is none righteous, no, not one. I shared with you about the young man I had met with who had a problem with drugs. You know, the last time that he and I met together, it was two months before he was killed. I, and I got a phone call from him late at night and he was really apologetic, but he really, really needed to talk to me. Um, we met at one of those small uh, eateries near San Jose State that's open till the wee hours of the night. This was like my fourth dinner that night because I was eating every time I met with someone, right? I got really weird during that time. Anyways, so I, I was meeting with him and, and ordered some food and we were eating and I sat across from the table. I couldn't have been more than two or three feet away from him. 
But if I'm completely honest with you, I'll tell you that night, the distance between me and him, it was like a world apart. And I didn't mean to do this, I didn't, and I didn't want to, but I couldn't help but think, you know, as I was sitting there, I am so thankful that I didn't do drugs. I am so thankful that I didn't get myself into this kind of mess. I'm so thankful that, you know, I'm not the one who's sitting there with the shakes going through withdrawal, you know, and, and sweaty and, and clammy hands. I am so glad, I am so glad, I am so glad, right? Yes, I should be thankful for my upbringing and for my circumstances that I didn't end up in that situation, right? But if my thankfulness crosses a line and starts to become condescension, that's a very dangerous, dangerous territory, right? Now, in that situation, I think it's, it's easier to point out the discrepancy in, in our uh, social standing, if you say, or in, in our uh, moral compass, and it's easy to point out that you shouldn't feel that way because you, you think you're better, even though it's a drastic difference. But let, let's bring you a little bit closer to home. You know, something that is extreme, right? Maybe in your life, you have friends or, or people you, who, who others call your friends that you don't want to be called your friends, right? I, I think all of you know someone like this in your social circle. You'll, you'll admit that they're your acquaintances. Yeah, I know him only because he knows my friend, right? You want to distance yourself from them because whatever it is, maybe their behavior isn't good, Maybe their, their character isn't great. Um, frankly, it's an embarrassment to be associated with them, right? I, I don't want to associate with this kind of person because he's not respectful of teachers or he, he speaks out, out of turn or he, he cusses a lot. And I just, yeah, get away from me, right? And, and you barely, barely tolerate these people. And, and sometimes maybe you wish that they didn't exist or at least, at least that they're not considered your friends, right? That maybe they'll go somewhere else during lunchtime. You know, they'll, they'll hang around, get away, get away, get away, right? It's, it's like an annoying little brother, get away, stop, stop following me. And you know what message Jesus has for you and me today? The message that Jesus has for you and me is, you're no better than that person. I am no better than that person. None of us, there is none righteous, no, not one. Right? The minute that we start to think that we are somehow better, we've crossed into Pharisee territory. Right? There, there was another young man that I had met, much younger man, not, not in college, and you know, he was overheard saying that he didn't want to attend a Bible study because oh, I already know everything that they can teach me. And an adult who was there corrected him and said, you know what, the fact that you think you already know everything that they can teach you shows that you don't know everything that they can teach you. And you would think, coming, coming from an adult, hearing that kind of rebuke, he, he, he would shape up a little bit, but he thought about it and he said, no, I'm, I'm pretty sure I know everything already that they could teach, right? When we've been Christians a long time, sometimes we can grow callous, sometimes we grow arrogant, and really, we, we start to draw a very clear line between us and them, okay? And then, and then we start to pray prayers like this, God, Thank you that I am not like one of them. Thank you that I am not like one of them. You know what? We are not the Good Samaritan. Yes, we are not the Good Samaritan. That's Jesus. Nevertheless, he did set an example for us to follow. And because he is the example, it's going to be hard to love as he loved. Right? That's why the Bible tells us, Jesus said, if you want to follow him, what order of steps you got to do? You have to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Him. And that in and of itself is like a three-week sermon series right there. But there is a difficulty, a real difficulty in following what Jesus did. Because you have to get rid of yourself. It is yourself, your, your, your pride, that makes you think that somehow because you are saved, because you've been a Christian longer, that you are better than someone else. But here's the thing. We must... Never, never, never forget that we, even though we are saved, that we are also the sick who need a physician. That we are also sinners who are in need of repentance. We must never, never forget that. This is song we sing this morning. I am only a sinner saved by grace. The song, 
right, as you sing it, it's very happy. Only a sinner saved, right? You know what? If you really think about the words of the song, it's putting you in your place as you sing it. I have nothing to boast of. No merit had I. It wasn't by the tears I cried. Nothing. I am only a sinner, right? And the word sinner, we say it so easily. It just rolls right off our tongues. But as we sing that song, we need to remember, we are just sinners. Just like the people who haven't heard Jesus' good news. The only difference is that we heard the news. Someone brought us the news, and we heard it, and we received it, and we said, yes, that is the only difference. We are no better than they are. We are, as humanity, as mankind, every single one of us, everyone is that lost sheep. We are not the 99. We are the lost sheep, and we are in need of the Good Shepherd who is seeking us who is seeking us not just on the day that we were saved, but he is seeking us every day. Because you know what? If you just look back at your life, look back at every day that you have lived since you came to know Jesus, if you look at every moment, I think if you're honest with yourself, you know that you need Jesus every hour. And we sing this song, I need thee every hour. Why? Because even though we are saved, we are still living in the sinful flesh that if left to its own devices, would find plenty things to do that are not honorable to God, would find plenty to do that would actually make God angry. As I sat at the table two feet away from, from my dear brother who's passed and gone to be with the Lord, I am no better than he is, except that my sins are better well hidden and they are not ones that would lead me into physical harm as much, and they are not sins that if were found, I would be arrested for. But I am just as much a sinner as he is, right? And, and we, we, we should never compare the magnitude of the sin, because guess what? In God's eyes, even one little, one little sin, you, you've, you're fallen, you're done for. Not that any of us only have one little sin, right? We would like to use that example, but none of us are ever like that. We are all so fallen. If we would just, if you would just at the end of your day, rewind your day, and in prayer come back and repeat to our Lord and Savior every thought, right? If at the end of your day you came and repeated to the Lord every single thought you had that day, there's going to be moments when you're blushing, when, when you would not dare to repeat what you had thought because your mind goes terrible places. It's like surfing YouTube, right? Two hours later, you're in the deep, dark territory of YouTube. Our minds left to their own without the constant supply and supervision of the Holy Spirit goes off in the dark, dark places. And so, even after we're saved, the only thing that makes us, the only difference is that the blood of Jesus covers us when we receive the gospel. And so, what I want us to take away this morning is to be reminded that I am only a sinner. I am only a sinner. Just like the guy who was stealing and using drugs. Just like the boy who thought he knew everything that the Bible said he could teach him. Just like the tax collectors and prostitutes and adulterers. And guess what? Just like the Pharisees and scribes even, right? A lot of times we read the Bible and, and even if with, with the people around us, we don't have an us and them attitude. When you come to Pharisees, you know, you know when Jesus is talking about the Pharisees, when the scriptures report that there's something to be shown that you shouldn't do. And so automatically there's a, oh, that's the Pharisees. Don't do what they did, right? But guess what? We are sinners and so are they and we are no, no different than the Pharisees and scribes. We, we so much take joy in looking down on them. Right? Don't ever forget, don't ever get used to His grace. Don't ever let it get old. You know, if, if we can, let's close this message with singing that, that last song again. Just the chorus, right? As we sing that last hymn, can we reflect on the Good Shepherd who came looking for you? Remember His love in which He sought you. Remember His blood that brought you, and remember His grace that brought you back to the fold. What a wondrous grace 
that brought you to the fold. As we sing it, think about the love that He has shown us. And let that love permeate us and remind us that really we are no better. It is only then, only then when you can get rid of this us and them delineation that you would have any chance of preaching the gospel to someone. So we, we don't need the guitar for this. So let's, let's sing together that verse. Oh, the love that sought me Jesus, I thank you for your grace that brought me back into your arms. And Lord, please do not let me or any of the rest of us here this morning ever forget, Lord, that it was only by your grace that we can come to you. It was only by your grace that we can be called children of God. And it was not by anything that we had done, Lord. And so pride, I abase, Lord. Help each one of us to deal with that pride that is in our hearts that, that makes us think somehow that we are in some way better than anyone else. Lord, deal with that this morning, Lord, and give us the humility that we need to know that we are only sinners saved by grace. I thank you for these words. I thank you again for your reminder of your love. And I pray this in your precious name, Jesus. Amen.